In this video, we are going to go over energy and chemical reactions. So we've seen previously different types of chemical reactions, and we saw that atoms are going to rearrange their uh, bonds, right? So, so they can form something new. So all of the energy or most of the energy that's in a chemical reaction is going to come from those bonds that are changing. So let's start by talking about bond energy. So all objects typically are going to move spontaneously into a position that has minimum energy. Um, so that's kind of like me. I, I like to sit on the couch and watch TV, right? So I'm going to typically move to a position of minimum energy unless someone forces me to get up. Um, and that's the same with atoms and bonds. They want to be in a position that has minimum energy. Um, so atoms are going to bond together to form compounds because that allows them to attain lower energies than when they're individual atoms. And um, we talked about this a little bit in terms of ions. Um, Ions like to transfer electrons because it makes them more stable, like a noble gas. And then uh, atoms like to share electrons to also achieve an octet like a noble gas and become more stable. Now, down below, I'm showing you sort of a, uh, well, it's called a potential energy diagram, but this is showing how if we have two atoms and they're too close together, they might start to repel each other and that's going to cause uh, friction and uh, this will be pretty unstable. Now, if we go down this diagram, our energy of the atoms is going to decrease as they start to reach that perfect bond length where they're just close enough that they're either sharing electrons or they're attracted through charge um, and they are super stable. So there might be some overlap here or some attraction, but they're the perfect distance apart from each other. And then um, over on the right here, we have sort of the, the middle ground where these atoms have no overlap. They're too far apart from each other and they're still somewhat unstable. So really we want, we want this minimum energy down here. Now, if we put energy into a molecule that has multiple bonds, we can actually break those bonds. Um, and then we can separate that molecule into individual atoms. So kind of like on this last slide. So if we're down here at the, the bottom of this energy diagram, so let's say we're here and we have two atoms bonded together. If we just add some energy, we can break those atoms apart. And that's the bond energy. So every bond has a different energy that it needs in order to break apart. All right, so let's look at this table here. We have different bonds on the left. So for example, we've got the carbon hydrogen bond. And in order to break that bond, we need 100 kilocalories per mole. So for every mole of a carbon hydrogen bond, we need 100 kilocalories of energy to break it. Um, below that, we have a carbon oxygen bond, which requires a little less energy. If we have a double bond between carbon and oxygen, we actually need more energy, 190 kilocalories per mole. And that's because a double bond is actually stronger than a single bond. 
So you'll even notice down below this triple bond between two carbons. That requires 200 kilocalories per mole to break apart. So you get the idea. There's very specific energies that are needed to break each type of bond. So in general, energy is required to break a bond. And when we form a bond, the opposite happens. So when we form a bond, energy is released out into the universe. Um, so typically that's going to come out as heat. So down below, I have just some diagrams. So again, uh, breaking a bond requires energy. And that amount of energy is called the bond energy. And then if we actually form a bond between two atoms, energy will be released in the form of heat, typically. Now, again, keep in mind that triple bonds are stronger than double bonds, and double bonds are stronger than single bonds. So triple bonds are going to require more energy to break than double bonds, which require more energy to break than single bonds. So let's apply that to chemical reactions. Um, so energy changes in chemical reactions are usually measured as changes in enthalpy. So we get this special term for chemical reactions called enthalpy. And this is given the symbol delta H of the reaction, Rxn. And we can also call that a heat of reaction. Now, previously, uh, we saw heats of fusion and heats of vaporization, um, but that was for uh, changes of state. So we weren't breaking any bonds. Um, we were just kind of separating molecules into more of a liquid state or into a gaseous state. But in this, we're actually going to physically break bonds apart and rip those atoms apart and then put them back together and make something else. So we need a special term for that, right? So this enthalpy change or heat of reaction is approximately equal to the sum. So this symbol means uh, sum. Oh, my pen isn't working. Let's see. There we go. <laughs> so the sum of bonds that are broken minus the sum of bonds that are formed. So this will be the bond energy. So for example, let's calculate the change in enthalpy for the following reaction. So in this reaction, on the left, we have two molecules of H2, which is hydrogen gas. So that's H2. And then we're adding one molecule of O2. And then it looks like we're forming two molecules of H2O. So what we're going to do, we're going to break these hydrogens apart. And we're also going to break these two oxygens apart because they all need to rearrange and form water molecules. So then at the end, we're going to form new bonds between hydrogen and oxygen. And we're going to do that for both water molecules. OK, so let's look up these values. Let's see what the bond energy values are for um, H2O2 and then H2O. So let's go back to our table. OK, so going down our list, oh, we have the energy for H2. 
So that's 105 kilocalories per mole. And then right below that is the energy for O2 to break those atoms apart. So we need 119 kilocalories per mole. Okay, so let's go back. So our heat of the reaction is equal to, uh, let's see, so let's add together what we have. We have two times 105 kilocalories per mole. So that's for the H2 molecule. And we're going to add that to the energy to break the O2 molecule. So that was 119 kilocalories per mole. All right, so that takes care of the bonds that are broken. Okay, so now we need to figure out the uh, bond energy for the ones that are formed. So the only bonds we're forming are between oxygen and hydrogen. So let's go back to our table. And it looks like the bond energy for oxygen and hydrogen is 110. Okay, so let's go back. So according to our equation, we need to subtract that energy. And we have four of these bonds, right? There's four of them. So we're going to multiply that energy by four. Okay, so this will tell us the amount of heat that the overall reaction uh, produces or gains. It kind of depends on the reaction. Some reactions overall absorb heat or they overall release heat. So let's see, if we calculate this, we have two times 105 plus 119 minus four times 110. So the value I got is negative 111 kilocalories per mole. Okay, so we got a negative number. What does that mean? <laughs> uh, so if you have a negative number, that means that heat was released overall from this reaction. All right, and that kind of makes sense. Um, we formed four bonds, we only broke three. Um, so that sort of makes sense that we would uh, produce heat at the end. So this brings us back to those terms we learned before, endothermic versus exothermic. But now we can apply this to chemical reactions. So if, um, let's say you have a reaction that requires energy overall, so it absorbs energy, this would be an endothermic reaction. So heat will flow from the surroundings to the system, which is the reaction itself. And the enthalpy of the system will increase. So that special term enthalpy, which really just means heat of reaction. So that would mean that delta H is positive. But just like we saw on the last problem, if your delta H is negative, that means you have an exothermic reaction where heat is released uh, and the enthalpy of the system decreases. All right, so for example, an endothermic reaction might be uh, a reactant plus heat will form a product, let's say, B. So in an endothermic reaction, heat is required. 
so heat is absorbed. So we can consider it a reactant in a way. But in an exothermic reaction, heat will be considered more of a product because it's being released from the reaction. So we could write that A turns into B plus some heat. Okay, so let's do another practice problem. Oh no, my uh, slides are messed up again. I'll rewrite the equation here. So we're going to calculate the change in enthalpy for the following reaction, which I'm going to rewrite. So hydrogen gas is going to react with bromine gas, and we're going to produce two molecules of hydrobromic acid, HBr, which is also a gas. Okay, so uh, we want to determine, is the reaction exothermic or endothermic? And is heat considered a reactant or a product? Okay, so remember our enthalpy change or heat of reaction is equal to the sum of all of the bonds that are broken, so all of their energy, minus the sum of all of the bonds that form in the products. All right, so let's draw H2. That looks like this. And then Br2 will look similar, except we have bromines instead of hydrogens. And then HBr... Oh, I forgot all my valence electrons. Let me put those in for bromine. And then we need another HBr as well, since we formed two of those. Okay, so see if you can figure out which bonds are broken and which bonds formed. And then I have a table off to the right with the bond energies for each type of bond. And see if you can calculate the heat of reaction for this particular reaction. And then we'll uh, go over it together. Okay, so let's see. Um, I'm going to highlight the bonds that are broken in blue. So it looks like we have to break this HH bond so that the hydrogens can bond to bromine in the end. And that means we also have to break our bromine-bromine bond so that they can bond with hydrogen. So we have those values in our table over here. And then it looks like we're forming two HBr bonds. So we also were given that value off to the right. Okay, so let's write out our equation. So our heat of reaction is equal to our bonds that were broken. So that's 105 kilocalories per mole for the HH bond that we broke. And then we're going to add 46 kilocalories per mole for the bromine bond that we broke. And now let's subtract 2 times 87 kilocalories per mole. And that will be to take into account the HBr bonds that we formed. Okay. So um, I got a value of negative 23 kilocalories per mole. And it looks like we have correct sig figs there, so that's good. Now, the value is negative. So does that mean that the reaction is exothermic or endothermic? Exothermic, right? Because on the last slide, we said that if delta H is negative, that means you have an exothermic reaction. 
That also means heat is a product. So let's write that down. The reaction is exothermic. Heat is a product. So it is released. All right, so this is important because we can utilize this in different scenarios. For example, if you've ever used a hot pack, uh, let's say if you've gone um, out into the snow somewhere, uh, hot packs typically need to be broken up to start a chemical reaction. And once you start that reaction, you start to feel the heat from that pack. Um, so that's an exothermic reaction. So that's providing heat to the surroundings, which would be your hands. Um, ice packs are similar. So some ice packs, you have to kind of break them up to get a reaction started. And those reactions will be endothermic. So they're going to absorb heat from your hands into the ice pack. And that's why it feels cold. Um, so that's why this is really important because if you know which reactions can release heat or which ones absorb heat, you can utilize that again in different scenarios. Now, one last thing before we wrap up chapter seven, we can also express endothermic and exothermic reactions using energy diagrams. So this is a visual representation of what's going on. So on the left, we have an endothermic reaction. And on the x-axis, we just have the progress of the reaction as it proceeds. On the y-axis, we have the amount of energy for our reactants and products. So in an endothermic reaction, uh, reactants are typically going to be lower in energy than the products. And that means that energy needs to be absorbed in order for the products to form. On the other hand, if we look at the diagram on the right, we have an exothermic reaction. So in this type of reaction, um, typically the reactants are going to be uh, less stable or have more energy than the products. And so energy is released. Okay, so these are very simplified diagrams. Um, if you go on to take more chemistry in the future, you might see more detailed diagrams. Uh, but this is just to express the, the idea of endothermic versus exothermic reactions. All right, so to summarize, endothermic reactions, we know that heat is absorbed by the reactants uh, to form products. So that would be A plus heat forms our product B. So since heat is absorbed from the surroundings, the surroundings are going to get cold. So this is like that ice pack example. Now we also saw that in an endothermic reaction, the heat of reaction is positive. But that means that the bonds that are broken in the reactants are stronger than the bonds that are formed in the products. So the reactants would be more stable. And that means that the reactants are lower in energy than the products. So we can represent this with an uphill energy diagram. For an exothermic reaction, heat is released to the surroundings. So that means that A would form B plus heat, and heat would be a product. So since heat is released by the reaction to the surroundings, the surroundings will feel hot. So this would be like that hot pack example. And then we saw earlier that the heat of reaction for an exothermic reaction is negative. 
And that means that the bonds that are formed in the products are actually stronger than the bonds broken in the reactants. So products would be lower in energy than the reactants. And that's why we represent this with a downhill energy diagram. Okay, so that is the end of chapter seven. We covered a lot about heat transfer and energy. Um, and I believe in the next chapter, we're going to really focus on gases. So I will see you in chapter eight.